Welcome to Webinar Wednesday, From Words to Sentences and Beyond, Common Problems and Fixes. We'd like to welcome you today on behalf of the Florida Department of Education, Stephanie Decker, Director of Adult Education, as well as my co-presenter today, Susan Pittman, and myself, Bonnie Goonan. Let's talk a little bit about today's webinar. As we go forward, please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted in the IPDA webinar archive. As in all the other webinars that we've had, if you've got a question, please type it into the Q&A option today because your microphones will be muted. So you're going to be in listen-only mode so that we have the quietest atmosphere possible. And again, please realize that not only the PowerPoint and the presentation itself, but also the workbook that we're going to be discussing in a little bit will be archived and available on the IPDA website within 48 hours. So, let's get started today. Today, just for your uh, knowledge, June Rawl is not with us, but she does give her best as we get going. So, this past a uh, couple months, we've been doing some workshops in the state of Florida on ABE skills. In fact, in the writing and reading process, we talked about some of the higher level types of writing skills. What we did not talk about were those basic writing skills, how to develop a sentence and then go a little bit that next step. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Susan and I are going to be exploring some strategies to help your students improve their sentence structure and how they can create effective topic sentences, that beginning part of writing paragraphs, and of course that ever important paragraph structure, and as always, some resources that we hope will help you in the classroom as you teach your ABE and literacy students. So. We've talked a little bit about that sentence. From the National Center of Literacy and Numeracy for Adults from the University of Waikato, their comment is that a word is just a bunch of letters and sounds, whereas a sentence is really nothing more than just a bunch of words, a paragraph, a bunch of sentences, and an essay, a bunch of paragraphs. Susan, I think that says it all, don't you? Well, not exactly, because sometimes we have a little bit more that has to go with that. And so sometimes you just got to go with the flow. Because when we write, we write in sentences. And unfortunately, our students sometimes don't do this. But we begin beginning with a capital letter. We wind our way over words and phrases until we've expressed a complete thought. And then we mark the end point with a period, question mark, or an exclamation mark. So it's not just, Bonnie, a, a bunch of words, but it's the words and phrases, all those things that, that convey a thought of some kind. And not just half a thought, but a complete thought as we're going through. But you know what, Bonnie, let's take a look and see if this looks familiar to those of you who are out there today with us. Uncle Tom has called his grandson, who is over 90. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Let's look at another one. Because I ate dinner. Oh, I think I saw that with a couple of my students that were out there. Give me another one. Traveling home late at night. My best friend, Felicia. Huh. Hmm. I don't think there's a thought there. <laughs> There's a part of a thought, but not quite. I went to the store. I got milk and cookies. Well, mm. boy, that looks like a very, very familiar problem that our students have. One more. Excellent skills in written communication is required. I don't think that's exactly what they meant to say, but, you know, I'll, I'll give them credit for the capital letter at the beginning and there's a period at the end. So you don't think skills is, is appropriate? I, I don't think, I don't think skills is exactly what we want on that particular one, especially, you know, as we're trying to impress people with our writing skills when going in to apply for a job or 
heaven forbid, you know, we, we get up into uh, some of these tests that we have that we have to take, and we certainly don't want to do that type of thing. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about what we have, some problems that we tend to have, because there's some sentence construction problems. Um, that we have as students are working through. One of them, you know, Bonnie, there are several of them, but the first one, these fragments, we see this all the time because actually to students, they'll think of this, well, it's a full thought because some students work part-time while taking a full load of classes, but there's something missing in that and it's not telling me everything I need to know. But if it's not a fragment, body you know as well as I do, oh, it can be a run on Or it can be that infamous comma splice that's out there. My family went to Australia and then they, then they immigrated to Canada. And you know kind of the interesting thing there, Bonnie, is that I wanted to insert a word just naturally as I was speaking, but this is the way we would see students as they're writing. Or for those in ABE classes, and especially the lower level classes, we get these short, choppy sentences. And our students, they, can, they, they talk differently than that. They can certainly do more than alligators or reptiles. Alligators are large. I think, Bonnie, I could probably put all of those into one sentence. And it, I think it might even be a little bit more interesting than what I see there. And then again, we have those who want to kind of string us along. Many students attend classes all morning and then they work all afternoon and they also have to study at night, so they are usually exhausted by the weekend. <sighs> <laughs> I know, you know, you run out of breath as you're going through. Of course, I know some people who talk like that too. So, um, but at the same time, these are the types of things that we see that are real construction problems for working with our students. So, Bonnie, what can we do to avoid those problems? Where, where do we start? Well, the first part is we do know that we have to teach subjects and predicates. So, we need to make sure our students know, is it a sentence? And one of the easiest things we can do, and I'm sure that most of us have done this in a past life, is to do sentence strips. One of Susan's and my favorite little manipulatives, where we write phrases that are sentences and we write phrases that are incomplete. And you know, you can do even a game with this, where on the, your board or a pocket chart, you've got those two columns and each student gets a sentence strip and they have to place those strips under the correct heading. Either it is a sentence or it's a not a sentence. And you can even use this short little activity and extend it where on the incomplete sentences, students go ahead and write it correctly. Maybe it's a capitalization problem or a punctuation problem, or it's a couple of those problems that Susan talked about before. A very easy activity, and sometimes we forget to start at the beginning with our students. So that subject and predicate, very simple sentences, very simple, incorrect or incomplete sentences, a quick and easy route to go. Another one that my students always liked was the silly sentences where there'd be packets that I would give them of subjects, verbs, and predicates, and they'd have to put them together, and oftentimes they would form very silly sounding sentences, however, they were complete, such as, the big butterfly flew in a jar of jelly. Well, you know, that's kind of silly, however, there is a subject and there is a predicate. So, as we teach students, we need to start at the beginning, that they recognize the simple sentences and they recognize a simple, incomplete sentence. But we do want to go just a little bit further. And so, one of our favorite authors, Steve Piha, talks about effective sentences and the structure that he's used. And so, let's take a look at what Steve says, first of all, effective sentences are. First of all, he says they're fluent. They have a variety in sentence beginnings. We don't want to hear the same thing over and over. Susan went to the store. Susan bought a magazine. Susan read the magazine. Gets pretty boring. We want to make sure that some of them are a little longer and have a different structure, so there's that variety. 
And of course, so we want them to be able to be read expressively that when students write an effective sentence and they reread it or we read it to them, that they really sound good. And of course, we want them to have structures that are easy to understand. So we're not sitting there saying, hmm, what did they mean when they wrote that? Of course, we know correct conventions of English, but sentences, as all writing does, is really to communicate. Piha gave us a great route to go in teaching those parts of a sentence that beyond the subject and predicate. His comment is as he teaches his students how to write an effective sentence, he talks about, first of all, the main parts, those parts that have the main action of a sentence. He says that, you know, the main parts are the subject, person, place, or thing, and of course, the predicate, the action of the sentence. And that's that beginning of a sentence, and of course, we need to teach it, but there's more to an effective sentence. His comment is we should also have lead-in parts. Those introductory phrases can be a lead-in part. And we need those in-between parts. And as the name implies, these parts go in between. Sometimes we call those things a positives if it's referring to Susan, my partner, and does something. But there's some other things. They feel like that slight interruption. But an effective sentence also has add-on parts, those extra parts that give us additional information. And what I really like that Steve Piha has supported is he says this is a really easy way to teach students how to write more effective sentences. And one of the easiest routes is to go ahead and put these basic segments of a sentence into a chart so that they can actually see the chart See the different parts. Is it the main part of a subject or the main part of a predicate? Is it a lead-in? Is it an in-between or is it an add-on? And to provide students with a simple sentence and see can they first of all place the sentence in the appropriate part, such as Jason jogged quickly down the road. And we can see that we've got in this particular sentence a subject and we have a predicate. After students are comfortable identifying the parts of a sentence, then we can have them go a little bit further. And we can teach them to expand those, student, those sentences by adding parts until we get to something like this, where they have a lead in on a warm summer morning. We have the main subject, Jason. We have that in between. Hmm, Jason. A young man, what did he do? He jogged quickly down the road. And my add on is and set off on a new trail that he had been wanting to explore. Now, we all know that we're not going to have every single part for each sentence that we write, but it's a great way to teach students how to expand that basic sentence. Okay, let's go a little bit further. If I gave this particular sentence to my students, could they identify each segment of that? Could they see that in the heat of the afternoon is the lead in? Could they identify that main part of it, the subject, the ice cream truck? Could they also do the main part of it, the predicate turned onto our street? Could they identify that in between addition about the ice cream truck was that it was old and it was dented with wear? And could they do that add on that when that ice cream truck turned onto our street, it slowly stopped before a crowd of waiting children? I don't know about you, Susan, but I would have been thrilled had my students been able to have this type of a chart and really expand something instead of just say, the ice cream truck turned onto our street. Because it really helps our well, students not only know the different types of conventions, but really make a more effective sentence. Well, and I think, Bonnie, what you could do, I mean, this leads in very easily to starting out with, just as you said, you know, you, you give them the subject, you give them the predicate. And maybe the first time you start with that, you're just going to have them do a lead in. Because maybe the in-between is a little bit more challenging. 
for them as they go through. But they get comfortable with that. Then you say, okay, well, you did a good lead-in. Let's see if you can do an add-on. And move around from different parts. And maybe sometimes you only want certain things in there. So, I mean, I think this just opens up so well for across the board for those ABE students to give them a structure. And also, you know, we're not getting tied up in, in terms like, you know, a positives or introductory phrases. We're actually going at this from, okay, I know I can understand this. Maybe I understand it a little better and I won't kind of break out by hearing certain terms. I can always add those later. But at the same time, this gets them into more of their thoughts as opposed to focusing so much on specific parts within grammar itself. You know, so true. And we just have to always make sure, Susan, that students understand when they are given a sentence how to first put that into the chart before we really ask them that higher level skill of creating one themselves. So, you know, That's to good. me, this is it's a set, great... It sets up beautifully. It yeah. sets up beautifully. It really does. But, you know, sometimes as a teacher, I may need other options, other strategies. I think this is a wonderful one. But, you know, as we have taught for so many years and as we've trained, we've come upon a number of other different types of strategies that have been shared with us by the field or that you and I have used. And so... We always love to give you, as participants, lots of ideas, and so we're going to talk a little bit about five other ideas that will help you in creating sentence writing activities for your students. And so as you look at this, let's break these apart, Susan, and talk a little bit about each one of them and how you and I have used them, not only in our trainings, but with also our students, okay? Okay, that sounds good. Well, why don't we start out with cre create one out of four because again what did we say earlier those short choppy sentences and so what we want to do is we want to help students build fluency so you give students four short choppy sentences and they have to figure out how to put those together into one cohesive thought and so as i'm sitting here you know i've got certain words that I'm repeating. There is a boy, the boy is small, there is a pond, the boy fell. Okay, so maybe it's the small boy fell in the pond. Wow. I'm changing things. Think about what all I'm doing there. I'm, I'm using certain words, but I'm eliminating certain other words. And in some cases, I'm maybe changing it around just a little bit because in those four sentences, I don't see the word into. So I, you know, I've added something to it, but now I think that sentence is much better than the one that we had before. I think the other thing here too, is that you're, you're really getting students, you know, to think through this revision process. And we're, you know, we always hound students later on about how important it is to edit and revise your work. And so what we want them to start doing now is to actually start that process. So, you know, we've, we've talked about this before about what does it mean when you revise? And you combine, you rearrange things. So in this case, we put small before the boy. It was a small boy. And then we subtracted out those extra words that we didn't need. And then we added that one, we expanded it. So those are the things that we want to get our students used to early on so that later on it's just a process that they, they do automatically. You but know, and by having things. them do the four sentences into the one, <laughs> instead of just saying, well, can you combine, can you rearrange, can you revise? All they have to do is look at their flu more fluent sentence and you know, as an instructor, we can say, oh, look at what you did. You did mm -hmm. all of these things. And I don't know about your students, but my students would have felt like they really did a great job, a whole lot more than they thought they could have ever done. Well, again, you know, we're taking this out of something that is quote unquote very technical. And we're just, you know, almost creating a game out of it. Can you do this? And then also for people who are the other students that, to be able to share these. 
so that they can see how different people put those sentences together, but still maintain that meaning that you saw within those four um, sentences itself. But I think there's another one we can do that, and I like it as well, the five W's and H. And, you know, we use five W's and an H for so many different things as we're going through. We do that as we're reading. We do it as we preview text. But in this case, we just start with a phrase. And we're looking at, in this case, made cookies. All right, we've got five W's that we have to deal with. We've got an H we have to deal with. So let's look back and, and use those prompts and start with who, where, and when. So we want to know who made the cookies, where those cookies were made, and when. So by just doing that, now we've come up, Shelly made cookies in the bakery in the morning. It's covered all those. But if we really want to get more descriptive, and that's really what we want to have students do, we can go with, okay, what or what kind? So in this particular case, we can start describing those cookies. What kind of cookies are they? Well, maybe they're oatmeal and chocolate chip, chocolate chip being my favorite. So we add that in. So Shelly now has made not just cookies, but Shelly's made oatmeal and chocolate chip cookies. Again, what are we doing? We're expanding out, we're adding in greater descriptors. But we still have to get to that how. And you stop to think about it, okay, what different ways could I express that how? And maybe I'm using a recipe that, you know, it's a special recipe from my mother, or in this case, using an old family recipe. But I started with that core of made cookies. Bonnie, you think you could uh, add a why in there? Um, oh, I do. I think that she made oatmeal and chocolate chip cookies in the bakery in the morning for her customers. That's why she did it. Okay. Or maybe she was making them for her uh, daughter's um, uh, Girl Scout cookie sale or something. You know, I know you're supposed to sell the regular cookies, but anyhow – you want to have that why. What was the purpose behind the act of making those oatmeal cookies? You know, um, those are the kinds of things that we want to do. And if we take a look real quick, I mean, you can use so many different phrases, but at the same time, here's just a few. I mean, went home, left school, found money, all those different things. None of those complex, all of those things, things that students would normally encounter but it's about going through the process itself, using those five W's and an H in order to get that more descriptive and more effective sentence as they're going through. You know, another one, and they term it sentence expansion, but you know, it's a lot like what you just talked about with those five W's and H, because that's what they take to expand. And so although it may be called something different as a strategy or activity, we're still using the same thing. And Susan, you know, as we're talking about this for ABE, ESOL students, these types of strategies also work great for ESOL or for ESOL, for literacy, for GED, because even our GED or adult high school students sometimes have a real difficult time in expanding a sentence and making it sound not quite as short, structured, choppy. So we can start with there's the frog on the log. And here again, we just take it very simply. There's a frog sitting. What kind of a frog? A small green one. How is he sitting? He's sitting oh so quietly. Where is he sitting? Of course, he's sitting on a log. And, and why is he sitting on that log? Due to the heavy, heavy fog. So we can do a little bit of alliteration with our expanded sentence. And we can say, there's a small green frog who is quietly sitting on a log due to the heavy, heavy fog. Doesn't it almost sound like poetry? Ha ha. <laughs> oh, well, not quite, but oh, getting closer. Okay. But you know what? The thing about that, though, Bonnie, is that, you know, by taking and adding that, that photograph there, you know, it gives students a whole other way of looking at this. And we can use those kinds of things as well to take a simple 
a, a simple photograph and from there be able to take a, a basic so true. about it and expand it out. How much better is that than, you know, just going through and doing some worksheets? You know, this, again, makes it so that it's fun, but at the same time, they're learning such a great skill. And I think we have one more here um, where we look at a sentence pyramid. And, you know, so many of these really are set along the same way. But this one you can actually see that over time what the student does is they begin to add information just like we talked about with our first graphic organizer, lead-ins and add-ons, and then we have those in-betweens. So if we take a look at it, the sun is setting. Okay, the sun is setting over the lake. The beautiful sun is setting over the lake. You've had some of those sunsets. The beautiful sun is slowly setting over the lake. You see how we're constantly adding to this to get more and more descriptive as we're working through. And now you've got the brilliant orange sun that's setting over the lake. And last but not least, we have the beautiful, brilliant orange sun is slowly setting over the lake. So you can see the pyramid as we're adding to that sentence and pulling more and more information into it. You know, Susan, this is a fun one to do, to make sure those auditory skills are going. We've done this with students and participants where one person will read that basic sentence and aloud, and the next person will listen closely and add to that sentence, and it goes around the room. So it's not just about writing or print writing. It's also about being able to speak more fluently. And this is a great activity to do that, to add that more creative bent or that fluency and expansion to sentences. So lots of different ways to use the activity. That's true. And then there is one other one that you can do. And again, this one, much more structured toward what we would see if we were working in English grammar, because we're looking at patterns and how those patterns can change sentences from our basic subject verb to basic subject verb and, and an object and on down through the list. Again, any one of these really great activities to use with students, the main thing is to get them thinking and understanding that you know, writing an effective sentence is not something that's beyond their means. It is definitely something that they can do, but they really need to begin to work through that process and practice. You know, maybe what you can do each day, just like we're doing the, the uh, either the one with the sentence uh, expansion or the sentence pyramid, maybe in class you have, you know, the sentence of the day and by the end, you know, students have to post what is your final sentence that goes with this. And they can compare all those. I think, you know, again, it's about getting students into that uh, process and spending time with it, working with it. You know, that's so true. And Susan and I both believe that there's not just one right way. But the more different activities that we can use with students, the more fun they have. And we all know that without an effective sentence, any type, of a writing structure is not going to be well done. It really does begin at the sentence level. And if you've been out to uh, Florida IP Day recently, you know that there's a whole lot of new grab and goes that are coming online. And so as you go out there, don't stop going out there. I believe we have 12 or 14 more that are going to be going up in the very, very near future. But this is one of them, and I'm just going to play, Susan, a little bit of it. I'm hoping that it comes through well, but just to show you that although you're going to have a short workbook today to look through things, and you will have the PowerPoint, you can use some of these videos, not just for yourself to learn more strategies, but also to work with your students. So let's just take a quick look at who did what, where, and when. Mm -hmm. Are your students struggling with writing effective sentences? 
If your students do not understand how a sentence is crafted, they will have difficulty in writing paragraphs as well as longer writing samples. Use the following activity to take away the fear of writing a complete sentence. On the board, write the words who, did what, where, and when. Discuss the words and give examples of each word by using a sentence. For example, Yesterday, Jenny interviewed for a new job at the local department store. Who? Jenny. Did what? Interviewed. Where? Local department store. And when? Yesterday. Now, have your students practice determining the who, did what, where, when of a sentence. Make sure to include different types of sentence structures so that students understand that sentences do not always start with the who or end with the when. On the board, write the following words. Who, did what, where, when. Cut the sentence into words and or short phrases that fit into the categories listed on the board. Give each student a word or phrase and place tape on the back. Let the student come up and tape the word or phrase on the board beneath the correct category. Let's see how it works. I have the sentence, Pierre runs every morning at the neighborhood park. Pierre would be placed under who? Runs would be placed under did what? At the neighborhood park would be placed under where? And every morning would be placed under when? Continue with as many examples as you have prepared. If there is disagreement, have students discuss and come to consensus with the placement. You can also develop a wall chart with words listed under each category so that students can pick words from the wall to create their own sentences. As students craft their own sentences, have them identify each of the categories. Students will quickly learn how to write more effective sentences and will transition to using grammar terms such as nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, subjects, and predicates. More importantly, they will have a deeper meaning of what these terms actually mean. What do you think, Susan? Oh, I love these things. Short, sweet, and students can go back to them as a reminder of what is it I was trying to do. But again, you know, the characters, you know, having that animation, but also, you know, letting students see you know, that hey, this doesn't have to be webinar difficult. Webinar Wednesday. Vocabulary, an important component of reading for meaning. Okay. I'm June you Rolf, know what? Director. With me today is Bonnie Gooden and Susan Pittman, IPDA's consultants and trainers, as well as national and international trainers for the, for the GE. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. Okay, so we'll go back. As Bonnie is moving back over to the PowerPoint, and to uh, some of the other information. What we're going to do, <laughs> just bear with us for just a minute, as we go through and we take a look at the next step. And that's really what we need to talk about is those topic sentences. And how are okay, we going to get students? <laughs> how are we going to get students to be more effective in this area? Because again, you know, we, we've got the components now, we're looking at effective things, but Let's look at how we would start out a paragraph and let's look at a, at a topic sentence. So we have a subject, which is our main idea, but it, along with that, we have what we call a controlling idea, what the author says about the subject. And then that topic sentence, when we, when we develop those, we're really setting up, Bonnie, a roadmap. And I love your phrase there, topic sentences are like handshakes, the stronger, the better. So those are the types of things that we want to do with our students. So let's take a look at what makes a, a topic sentence effective. It introduces the topic of a paragraph. And remember, at this point with our ABE students, we need to have them writing effective paragraphs. It really, a topic sentence should hook that reader in. You're like, oh, I want to know what else is being said. But the other thing you'll do for the reader is it starts that questioning process that every reader should have as they're going through, like, what's going to happen next? And a lot of different things that I'm thinking. Uses thought-provoking words. And think about it in terms of that it's usually the first sentence 
of that first paragraph, but, you know, it could be somewhere else within the paragraph. We've seen them in different places. But we're also looking at that topic sentence. When we have multiple paragraphs, it does provide us as a transition from one paragraph to the next one as we're moving through. So let's take a look, if we could, at a couple characteristics here. So we say it should be, uh, it consists of that main, sub main subject and the controlling idea. So what do we got? Hockey is the greatest sport in the world. Ah, look at that emphasis that we have going on there. Now, let's take a look at something maybe that a little bit different. Maybe we'll see this. I like all sports. Well, Bonnie, what's wrong with that? I like all sports. You know, it's just so general. There's no thought-provoking words. It doesn't really plant the questions. So it's just, you know, so what? I want to know more specifics than that for my topic sentence. But okay. I don't want it too specific. You know, like, my dog's name is John. Hmm. Why would I need to read anything else? It's all right there in one sentence. So too specific to really lead the way into a paragraph. And we want well, to make sure our topic sentence isn't a well-known fact because how does that plan any questions or be thought-provoking? So China has the largest population in the world, a fact, that's true. Um, okay, but that again does not lead into an interesting topic sentence. So okay. how do we teach it? We just need to first of all teach the parts that there's a subject and there's a controlling idea, such as the invention of the light bulb, that would be my subject, change the world in many ways, my controlling idea. I'd want to know how did that light bulb really change the world? Then my paragraph would give my reader additional information that would be very interesting to know. Or remember I said, you know, my favorite pet is a dog. Well, I could change that a little bit. I could say beagles make good pets. And my controlling idea would be for several reasons. So I would expect in that paragraph to find out the why. Why are you telling me beagles make good pets? I wouldn't have even thought that. But you're going to give me in that paragraph or in that short essay, the reasons why. So that's my controlling idea. So with the topic sentence, it really is nothing more than the subject and the controlling idea. And if we can get our students to write that way, then topic sentences aren't too difficult to do. But I think, you know what, we can go just into a very easy graphic. And sometimes it's called the three-part method because, see, we've got a subject here and we have a controlling idea for both the public store and, and the kitchen. Well, I can teach my students to identify the item they're going to talk about, select the verb they're going to use, and to finish their thoughts so that I really do have the subject and the controlling ideas. Dogs make wonderful pets because they help you to live longer. Hmm, since neither you or I have dogs right now, I'm not sure I want to know how they help me live longer, but it may be an interesting topic. What do you think? <laughs> no comment. Well, it okay. be. <laughs> Maybe what we have is the research has shown that oh. and, and go from there. But again, <laughs> You know, we really are trying to get that, you know, kind of that controlling idea. Where are you going? What are you trying to, what's the roadmap going to be? Whether it's the roadmap for that paragraph or it's as you've transitioned into a new paragraph as you're working with different things. So that's so, one you strategy. Know, there's, a number of, there's a number of different things that we want to do. And, you know, one of them for our students sometimes comes down to the fact that they, they don't have quite the words that they need in order to do this. And so we can give them these things called sentence starters. And I know, Bonnie, we've done that quite often as we're looking at, we call them frames, um, but we've done frames to, to set up the claim for um, you know, an, an argumentative essay. The same thing that we wanna do here is really give them a starter. 
so that they can see how would I handle something where I'm trying to explain the pros and the cons or what, what kind of words do I use for causation? Sometimes it's about helping students build that vocabulary and giving them that almost, you know, that frame that they can use in order to start the process. You know, that's so true. Um, so a couple different strategies, that three-part method or the subject controlling idea or sentence frames, all are excellent to get your students started in writing a topic sentence. When we worked um, together with you earlier this year on writing paragraphs to essays, we really did some strategies that could be used for both. But let's step back a little bit. Once our students can write effective sentences, once they can write, write effective topic sentences, then it's time for them to put a paragraph together. And we know that a paragraph has different characteristics. We know that it has to have unity. It needs to pull together and be talking about the same thing. It needs to be supportive and, of course, coherent. Again, pulling together. We know it needs to use effective language and a variety of structures. And we know that when we write a paragraph, just like when we write a multi-paragraph essay, there has to be some type of an introduction, there has to be a body to that paragraph, and there has to be a closing statement or a conclusion. Those are really the common commonalities of all paragraphs. That main idea with that topic sentence that names the subject and gives the focus or main point, the supporting details, those sentences that include information that we need to know about in order to understand the topic, and of course, that sum summization that just kind of puts everything together. And if you've been with Susan and me before, you know as we're looking at paragraph structure, Susan, does this look familiar? Oh, that looks like a peel to me. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and you know. I think that reminds me of a strategy <laughs> that's sitting out uh, there, a writing strategy. You think so? And I a, think so, too. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know so because, and the one thing that, that you have always done is we've been out in different states, and you said, just a little thing to think back home um, to <laughs> Florida with the peel. Because what do we want to do with students as they're writing and you know, this is true whether, whether we're doing a paragraph or Bonnie, we're doing something much longer than that. We really want to have a point yes. to the whole thing. You know, we really want to have some evidence. Oh my, that's that first E word. And it's something that we need to get students used to at the ABE level. So it's not such a big deal when they're doing writing like for the GED test. We also need students to be able to do something else within that paragraph. And that's Lane. You know, so we've got a point, we've got the evidence that backs that up, we've got to explain how that does it, and we've got to have it all linked together. So I think it comes back, like you said, it has that sense of unity, that uh, sense of coherence as we're coming through. So if we were to take a look at some examples here, we have a number of different things that we can do. So, you know, keep that peel in mind as you're moving through um, the process because we want to state our point, we want to support with evidence, we want to explain the evidence, and we want to link it to whatever our topic really is. So Bonnie, okay. let's take a look at, at that next slide if we could. Oh, but before that we're going to talk about just a, because I decided we had to do at least it's a sample of the point. So I'm going to say our ABE department at our school is great. Okay. Wouldn't What's you want your to know evidence more? to back that up? Well, teachers really work hard to make sure their lessons are interesting and relevant, and they create lessons to meet all of their students' needs. Well, let me ask you, though, how, are you going to, how do, can you really explain that? I mean, mm -hmm. I need a little bit more than that. Well, in 2016, students who attended classes achieved a 98% pass rate on their test. I think that explains that this department is good because the teachers work hard and those lessons are great. How about you? Uh, that sounds pretty good there. So it is linked back to 
what we were trying to do in terms of the topic itself. So now we know that's just one reason the department is so successful. That's great. And again, simple, P-E-E-L. Now, if we take a look at one more time, um, we have a point. Removing wild animals from their natural habitats is cruel. Now, we've got to have some evidence that goes along with that. And as you take a look at it, when kept captive, these beautiful creatures become bored and lonely. This often leads to a condition called zoocosis. Animals suffering from zoocosis begin to show problems such as rocking back and forth, grooming themselves excessively, ooh, or vomiting. Ooh. Now, we gotta explain that. Because, I mean, we've made these, this, we put this evidence in there, we gotta explain how that connects. So we have conditions such as this clearly demonstrate that wild animals belong in the wilderness, not in restrictive prison-like cages. And then we link it right back to the topic. Animals must be freed from zoos now so that this terrible suffering ends for good. Again, you know, I think, Bonnie, one of the really, really important things in here, well, there's actually two, but two really important things is that use of evidence because so many times in paragraphs, students are trying to figure out what to say and they don't, they don't know how to really expand out their ideas. They're trying to think of things rather than evidence and then to be able to explain that. You know, that's so true. And so Peel is one strategy to help your students create an effective paragraph and it can either be an opinion piece or it can be a factual based piece. Both work very well. But the other one that Susan and I love, and we've used this for a long time, both with students and with teachers, is the what, why, how. And here again, we can use it as a piece where students read something and they create a short paragraph, or it can be an opinion piece. What do you think? Why do you think it? How do you know? Once students are able to generate those ideas and details, this is that next thinking routine. And it's the routine that they have to use in argumentative writing, or again, we can start with the student's opinion. It's an absolutely marvelous graphic organizer, and as you can see, you do have it in your workbook, along with lots of other things. Students and I, or Susan and I, really like to get started with something that is simple and everybody knows something about. And so anything such as, what is your favorite car and why? Or here, what is the best grocery store in town? Everyone has an opinion of what that best grocery store is. So Susan, you know what? Pub I say Publix is the best grocery store in town. What do you say? No, I say the Fresh Market is the best grocery store in town. Okay, I say Publix, you say Fresh Market. I say it's Publix because it's clean. It has excellent customer service. It has a wide selection of products. That's my evidence. It's clean. Well, that's not your evidence. Oh, it's that's not? A reason. No, oh. that's a reason. Okay. Now you got to tell me, Bonnie. you got to go back and you got to tell me, how do you know it's clean? Okay. You but can't you know, just I... say something clean and leave it there. <laughs> See, my students would have said Publix is the best grocery store because it's clean, it has excellent customer service, and it has a wide selection of products. And you're right. That sounds really boring, and I've not supported it at all. So, so my next step is to tell you how I know. So I'm going to tell you Publix is the best grocery store in town because it's really clean. You know, the floors just shine and there has, there's no debris on the cabinets and counters. And anytime I walk into the store, it smells so fresh. Okay. Would I so persuade you now that it is clean? Well, I can come right back at you with <laughs> my fresh market. <laughs> However, what you've done in that, though, is that what, or what we've, we've been able to do with that is give students a paragraph. They're able to come in and talk about the cleanliness of that grocery store, the thing that helps make it one of the best grocery stores in town or the best grocery store. And then from there, students, with just those snippets that they have, 
of that evidence, they can construct the sentences that they need. And then as you've got covering into the next one, you've got other things that you can talk about. So it doesn't have to necessarily be three things. It could be two. It could be four. It doesn't really matter. But the main thing is that we need that reason. But beyond that, we need the evidence that supports that reason. And you know, when I've got all of that evidence, Susan, it creates a more effective sentence because it doesn't become just so choppy. I have that additional information to add to my basic sentence structure. And are you saying that you wouldn't do, it is clean, it has excellent customer service, it has a wide selection of products? Not if I have the evidence to go along with it. Absolutely. You can expand. Woo! expansion of those sentences as you're going through and those ideas and it all works together okay mythbuster how many sentences should a paragraph have susan five. Oh, you know what i have to disagree with you in fact um there was a quote out on the web from technical writing and it said some paragraphs should weigh a skimpy two or three sentences while others should weigh a robust seven or eight sentences both weights are equally healthy so no it doesn't require five sentences it all depends a paragraph should be as long or as short as it needs to be to develop a main idea. And that's a hard one for our students to understand that because the first thing they ask is, how long should my paragraph be? Absolutely. So again, what are we coming back to? We're looking at the quality of the writing as opposed to the quantity of the writing. Those are the Oh, I think I've heard that, that phrase before. <laughs> Absolutely. So, all right, so let's do one more thing here. And I know, Bonnie, you've got some resources Definitely. that you want to talk about. But if we kind of put it all together, what we've done today, and, and remember, we're focusing on to the ABE student because we want to build those skills so that as they're progressing through, that writing when they get, you know, in the upper levels is not going to be a problem. We want to make sure our students know how to compose a topic sentence. We want to make sure that our students know how to brainstorm supporting ideas. They need to have that opportunity and it works great if you can do this working in a group to do some of these things. We want students to be able to write a paragraph in the topic outline form. But you know what, Bonnie? There's one other thing we really want to make sure they do. It's got to be in a logical order. <laughs> we don't want something that's just haphazard. And that comes back again to having kind of that outline that we're looking for. We want to explain the ideas and we want to make sure, hey, if you brought them in with a hook, you want to make sure that you leave them with some kind of really great concluding sentence so that it's not just a repetition of that topic sentence itself. It brings it together as we're going through. So I think, you know, if we practice um, and give students an opportunity to work through some of these things and focus on their ideas, their thoughts, it can make a huge difference. You know, it really does. And we'll go to the workbook in just a moment. But if you've not been out to Florida IP Day recently, as we said, this one, this webinar really structured around starting with the sentence. And you'll get the webinar guide when you download items and we'll briefly tell you what you have in that in just a moment. But make sure you always look at the lesson plans. Maybe you're teaching ABE. Don't overlook the fact that many of the ESOL writing lesson plans work very well in your ABE. BE classroom and vice versa, that for those of you who teach ESOL, that you look at the ABE lesson plans, and these are three of them that will work very well. The ESOL writing, the using evidence one, and the understanding of fixes to unlock meaning. All of them talk a lot about from that sentence to paragraph level. There will also, as we said before, be additional grab and goes. A few of them that you'll be seeing in the next couple months coming online will be sentence building, sentence strips, and a different one that takes a different focus on what, why, how. 
There's so many websites out there, Susan, that work so well for us in the classroom, but just a couple that Susan and I really, really like. One is Teaching That Makes Sense by Steve Piha. He starts out with the basic sentence structure and goes all the way through very um, diverse types of writing skills, and everything he puts up there is free. Many of us know about Purdue Owl, but don't overlook the fact that Purdue Owl also has some resources that are not at that top writing level, but rather at that beginning writing level. And both Read, Write, Think and Read Works have fantastic ideas for us as we are teaching those beginning writing skills. And they provide us with both strategies as well as lesson plans and individual activities, which are absolutely marvelous. So, Susan, as I get to the workbook, do we have any questions out there? Um, at this point, no. We don't have any questions. But remember now, if you're interested in posting a question, you can certainly do that, and we'll be more than happy to answer those um, as we're going through. Okay, I've pulled up the workbook, and I just want to briefly review a couple things here. You have some sentence activities, everything from is it a sentence and silly sentences that we talked about earlier in the webinar, but also a couple games and activities. If we can make learning how to write a more effective sentence fun, students just seem to learn so much better. So you have a sentence rummy and a sentence matchup and a number of other things that you may uh, enjoy using, as well as some information on those parts of a sentence where we put the chart up and how to use that, expanding a sentence, etc. So everything that we covered in today's webinar, you have a little more or additional information on how each of those work. And again, you can see we have activities. I hope I'm not making anybody dizzy by moving. You also have, we watched the who did what, when, where, uh, grab and go. Here you have a little more information on that activity as well as some things on topic sentences and how to use each of those. You have, of course, peel and how that chart works. And you have a clean copy of the what, why, how chart. Last but not least, we always like to give you a few additional websites. And so you'll notice here you have a couple additional websites from what we shared with you on the webinar, on the PowerPoint itself. Things like Teach for Results and Writer's Web. And of course, PBS. We need to not ever overlook PBS, which has some great lesson plans. And as always, going back to Florida IP Day as new materials get put on. So having said that, Susan, additional mm -hmm. information, ideas, or questions for the day? Well, you know, the main thing is just to get out there and try some things. You know, give it a shot with some of your students, especially those who really have been struggling um, as they're trying to write. Uh, but, you know, come back and, and put some things in that are fun. Really consider doing that, you know, expanded sentence of the day or that sentence pyramid where students can kind of compete against each other to come up with those really creative but meaningful sentences. They still have to express a thought. Um, I know our students sometimes can get very creative, but those are all things that I think you'll find that working with this, you'll have a lot of success with. Um, when you get on into the paragraphs, what, why, how, the peel process, all of those things um, will work very well. And so we only have one other question that has come in. Are we able to download this workbook and how do we access the PowerPoint? And Bonnie, if I'm remembering correctly, that is going to be on Florida IP Day. Is that correct? Yes, it will. It will be uploaded to Florida IP Day, this whole uh, webinar today, that you'll be able to do the PowerPoint and the workbook. So go out to Florida IP Day, go under webinars, and you will see it right there. And then we have from uh, Stephanie McDonald, it says, great webinar. Many of the strategies are the same as what I used in K-5. I can see where I just increase and add rigor. Absolutely, Stephanie. We just have to, have to remember that there's some great strategies out there that work 
in all areas. It's about the content that we use and keeping that adult focus to it. And so, uh, you know, I'm glad to see that, you know, a lot of these things are going to be useful to you as you're going through. So that's great. Thank you. Susan, as we close out today, I want to thank everyone for being here with us today on behalf of Florida IP Day, Susan and myself, as well as June and our webmaster, Joseph. Uh, we are always pleased and we hope that out of today that there was at least one idea, one activity that you say, I can use that in my classroom tomorrow. So if nothing else, thank you very much for being with us and have a wonderful rest of the week.